please. Thank you. Thank you very much for this introduction and this warm welcome. <laughs> and I have no doubts that we will very well cooperate and develop some friendship, etc., etc. You have now raised expectations. And <laughs> I'm, I'm now under pressure to not disappoint you too much. Um, you know the topic of this lecture. I will start with a few um, elements or one element of theory. I know you are all more or less specializing in literary theory, so you may laugh at my uh, my humble uh, ideas. But I wanted to mention this um, uh, uh, I got it now. Yes, you can. Yes, thanks. Um, and um, I simply borrowed uh, what Robert Downton, one of uh, the uh, again, veterans of book history, because I'm much inspired by book history in this uh, field of research. So I borrowed this uh, communication circuit by, from Robert Downton. Uh, you can study it here, it's very simple. It's starting with the author via publisher, distribution sector to the book trade, and then books end up with readers, obviously. And then there is also a sort of uh, feedback uh, from readers to authors, but it's only a dotted line, so it's, this is a rather virtual uh, connection. But it, in the end you can talk about the circuit. And um, I thought about, what about translation? So, what can we do if it comes to translation? And I adapted it, I uh, inserted a few more elements, uh, which you can see mainly here. Okay, I can't use this. Oh yes, now it's back again. So, you see one addition here, mediators uh, between literatures, between countries, between cultures, something which is very uh, common when it comes to international cultural relations or transfer. Translators and their publishers. I, I will talk quite often about publishers today because it's, I think it's eminent what they are doing and their interests um, which um, influence even minor details in the text sometimes because they have some interests, maybe rather scholarly interests or commercial interests. So, I inserted publishers, their editors, readers and also here a new element uh, which I called intellectual and property, intellectual property regime, meaning the laws uh, regulating the international transfer. Uh, is it allowed to simply take a manuscript or a book which is already published and translate it, or do you have to pay? Is it possible to, to produce a second translation if there is already one existing? All this. Uh, uh, regulations in the background which are also very important and sometimes decisive um, in these translations, translation exchanges. So this is all about theory or methodology or what I thought about in the beginning. Um, I come now to the first substantial point, development of translation business between 1750 and 1850, of course only a raw uh, limitation. In the middle of the 18th century things really get dynamic. Uh, there is a lot of uh, changes, development, and I was interested uh, especially in women as translators, which appear about this period, middle of the 18th century. Um, and I, I read Virginia Woolf, very well known uh, essay, A Room of One's Own, where she, where she writes, I quote, hundreds of women began as the 18th century drawn to add to their pin money or to come to the rescue of their families by making translations or writing the innumerable bad novels which have ceased to be recorded even in textbooks. Um, this was sort of impulse, impulse uh, for this study. I then um, did a lot of bibliographic um, look around and I found that 
in this period, in, from the 18th to the 19th century, you find an increasing number of women translators. Um, some of them, like Louise Gottsched, are very well known in literary history. Uh, her husband, Gottsched, was a very important writer, important um, theoret theoretician of literature, etc. Uh, what we call now a pope of literature in the 18th century. So some of them, like Louise Gottsched, are very well known. Some are um, um, have attracted, some of them have attracted already the intention of, of uh, literary research. For instance, Elise Hohenhausen, I have the three names here um, on the bottom, and some of them are totally unknown. For instance, one woman called Emilie Wille, I really did my best and I worked hard to find any information about her. No biographical dictionary, nothing, nothing. So, it may be a pseudonym, there may have been somebody else behind this name, but um, so sometimes uh, this sort of study also makes you, I don't know, uh, it gives you no answers and you have to solve riddles, which is not always possible. So, um, then there are also in this period, middle, second, third of the 18th century commentaries about translations and the translation business. For instance, um, in a novel by Friedrich Nicolai, who was a very important um, supporter of Enlightenment, living in Berlin mainly, editor of reviews, etc., magazines, and writer, and he wrote a satirical novel uh, entitled The Life and Opinions of Magister Sebaldus Notanker, which appeared in 1773. And there I quote the translation, which is my own. You know, there are famous men who act as wholesale dealers, similar to Irish purveyors of salt meat for the Spanish fleet, and distribute the work among their assistant translators. Publishers who intend to produce translations consult them. They know all the workers, their special talents, and the wage they demand. They employ their assistants, correct their faults, or cover them with their reputation. You know that most of these entrepreneurs are experts in writing prefaces. It's a funny paragraph about uh, writing, publishing, and also translating. And Nikolai also talks about translation factories, or manufactories. It's rather old style. Um, sort of industry, he talks about um, translation manufacturers, later uh, commentators and critics talk, uh, wrote about translation factories. This is of course um, mainly a metaphor, it's not, um, there were no uh, real factories, but there was teamwork, um, I will come back to that. Um, translations were very often uh, made by teams, to be faster, to be, I don't know, to make things easier, mainly faster. All this um, um, development uh, led to books of a rather poor quality, I mean text translations of rather poor quality. Um, also the outer appearance of books uh, degraded rather, they were tended to be cheap editions also besides the old-style books for rather rich customers. Um, and I also have some, some figures. So, from 1765 to 68, we count among six to, uh, about 6-7% to seven uh, of translations, meaning the whole the rate related or compared to the total book production, 6-7% six, six of translations. Things change uh, drastically and dramatically uh, with, uh, in the first half of the 19th century. There we have, I have only uh, counted the novels, not the whole book production, this would have been too much. <clears throat> and I found that in 1820 we rise to 11%, you see the numbers here, 
And exactly at 1850, we have 50% of translations uh, in the field of novel production, which is also easy to remember, 1850, 50%. And I think this is rather impressive to notice. And um, it uh, changes, your, changes your reading of these texts. I studied particularly the translations of Walter Scott, his novels uh, starting in 1825, 1826, 1827, and I found that they were so careless and so um, superfluously done. Um, and of course, you can explain it if you if you if you um, take into account this context of all these developments. So. Um, also, the personalities, the background of the translators changes very much. Um, in the 18th century we have still mainly scholars uh, who are writing and also translating. In the late 18th century, scholarly writers as well as writers who did not succeed in earning a living from popular literature or journalism started to, to translate for money. So, it's uh, very obvious that um, writers now more and more wrote just to earn a bit of money and to make a living. Um, they were simply attracted by the fees and so we find uh, quite some people from non-literal professions among these translation uh, translators, for instance teachers and also officials. Um, And, and now I come slowly to my main topic, also women, of course, uh, their number increased. Um, and Louise Gottschied is still a representative of the old style. She's also a scholar, scholar, a women's scholar. Mm. And she's somehow the point of departure in this development in my short history. Uh, later, women translators whom I could find in, biogra bi in, biography, in biography, biographical dictionaries um, were mainly either unmarried, so single women, they were widows, or they were divorced. That's, that's really striking, <laughs> but that's how it is. And I, I made a short list. So, the names are not really uh, all of them important. Uh, the most... I, I skip Fischer and, and Julius, uh, so this is the list of, of women who translated very much. And, uh, of course, well-known is Dorothea Tick, daughter of Ludwig Tick. I will come back to her. And the others are more or less forgotten in literary history. So, uh, few words about Louisa Gottschied, as I said, as a point of departure. She was, as I also said, the uh, wife of, uh, of uh, this famous critic, and she um, translated something like 50 volumes, including Edison's Cato, The Spectator, this important uh, magazine, Pope's Rape of the Lock, and a lot of French comedies for the Deutsche Schaubühne uh, collection edited by her husband. And she somehow, um, she was rather innovative in what she did. Uh, she turned a bit away from this uh, mode of translation which we call uh, the Bella Fidel or they translated in English, the beautiful, untrue translation, <laughs> something like that, which was um, the, the dominant model up to the 18th century, coming from France, well known. And, and she started to, to, to move uh, a bit towards, uh, say, true translation. And um, um, I can't go very much into textual details here, um, but um, she, for instance, used dialect uh, in her translations, which was very, uh, I, say, I would say, daring at this 
point of time at this epoch. Um, she also had um, an important insight <coughs> when she translated um, Pope's Rape of the Lock, this famous uh, verse Epos, uh, epic. And she realized that she had to abandon her previous translation of the French version because she had used the French version as was the custom at this uh, time and had no, no idea about the English original. And when she, after 10 years, uh, she found, she, she got, uh, she came across the English version, she had a, a sort of revelation and she, she was struck and she, she wrote that um, uh, it, it was tremendous how this French translation deviated from the English version. And, and that's why she said there's nothing as false and different from the original as a French translation. So, um, very important um, insight which of course changed her approach and she would not anymore translate English books via French translations. Um, the choice of an English source text at the middle of the 18th century already was a sort of progressive poetical statement. Um, knowledge of English as a language was also not very, very widely uh, distributed. So, and because I mentioned the text and the textual details, um, Yeah, this is still um, a comment, uh, commentary on, on French translation. It's, it is uncertain if the natural carelessness of these people, the French, is to blame or rather its haughtiness and conviction that every author must be embellished under the hands of his translators, no matter what they do to him. In any case, it is sure that everyone who examines a French translation has had this experience. So now this uh, short, short, very short look at uh, the text, uh, for instance, uh, it, it is taken from from Rape of the Lock, and it it's an example that she really tried hard to find an equivalent. And um, in English, the swift on his suit pinions flits the gnome, which is very, of course. You notice it's very poetically, uh, very poetic formation, and uh, Louis Gottschalk's version is often short. The husten schwimmen, schwingen schwebt der schnelle Gnome fort. So she made an important step towards true translation or orient, oriented uh, herself uh, on the source text. There were some limits, important limits to this truthfulness to the source text because um, there were lots of taboos and um, uh, this is an interesting point when it comes to, I don't know, erotic uh, passages and for instance um, in this case there is this phrase and maids turn bottles called aloud for forks which has of course some sexual innuendo and uh, Louise Gottschild wrote, Und die Mädchen werden Gläser, die man deutlich ächzen hört. So I think this is a clear case of euphemism and uh, she turned down this, this phrase, obviously with regard to, to morals and to decency, bien séance, as uh, the French said. I now turn to Dorothea Tick, which I call I hope you don't find it too uh, and, uh, chauvinistic, <laughs> a translating handmaid, handmaiden, because she was really a helping hand of her father. Uh, she worked for him and more or less um, covered her activities as a translator. Um, you, of course, know that she translated some dramas, by Shakespeare, 
But what may be even more important is that she made the first complete translation of his uh, of Shakespeare's sonnets into German. And when I said that she covered her activities, that she was not interested in coming out as a, a literary writer or translator, she wrote uh, in this regard to a friend called Friedrich von Büchtritz, if you do not already know it, I let you in on a secret. I do contribute to the translations of Shakespeare, of Shakespeare's works. Unfortunately, this fact is known in Berlin, as my sister told me. This is very embarrassing, and I do not know how it came to be known. I believe that Reimer, that is the publisher of Tick, and um, that Reimer has spoken about it. I did not tell anybody, and I earnestly ask you to keep the thing quiet. Be careful also when taking to my father, since he would be angry if he realized that I told you the secret. So this shows, I think, quite well this uh, strange situation that somebody has to work, uh, but is, is hesitating to, to make it known. Eh? Um, Dorothea regarded translating as a means of immersing oneself in the work of a noble mind. Um, it's down here, this short quotation. So, um, she, I don't know, she had this uh, model of, of literature is a product of genius and if you are translating you have the, the, the occasion, the possibility to come near to such a genius. Um, this veneration of the original author led to a mode of translation in which the translator, translator tried to keep as close as possible to the source text. So she is again moving a step towards this true translation. Um, coming close to the source text. Such translations tend to be innovative since this mode of translation is a way of transferring new words and expressions into German literature. And that's exactly what she did when translating Shakespeare's sonnets. She was always looking for neologisms and coining new expressions in order to render and to transfer Shakespeare's sonnets. I cannot really go into detail here, it's also um, necessary, of course, to, to read German, to evaluate uh, her translations. One striking feature of, of her sonnets, uh, sonnet translation is that she, that she made clear that the sonnet, sonnets were addressed, uh, addressed a man, this lover in the background of all these sonnets was a male uh, being, and, and um, Dorothea did not hesitate to make this clear, whereas many, many other translators uh, thought of a woman or left this question open if it's a woman or other man. Mm, for instance, Karl Kraus, who was not very shy, he also translated um, Shakespeare's sonnets, and he addressed all these points to a woman. So we don't know why he did it, if it was a question of decency or a question of misunderstanding, no one will ever know, but Dorothee um, did, as I said, not hesitate to make these things clear, which was also rather daring, I would say, at this time. So, our next uh, woman translator is called Meta Forkel, and she was a member of one of the first real translation manufactories which was um, directed by Georg Forster, who is quite well known in German literary history, a writer of uh, travelogues and uh, one of the most important uh, persons, uh, figures in Enlightenment uh, in this context, also a uh, supporter of the revolution, so he was also under eyes of the censors. And he, um, around 1800, um, established a sort of translation manufactory uh, whose members were Benedicte Naubert, um, Sophie Mero Brentano and some others, Therese and Ludwig Ferdinand Huber. They really worked closely together and Meta Forkel was really one of the first professional female translators 
as far as I found out. She was one of the so-called Göttinger Universitäts Mamsein, which is a very nice formula, I think. Uh, the reason for this Göttinger Universitäts Mamsein etiquette is that they were, there were some girls, all of them daughters of university professors at Göttingen University, who were initiated into scientific and literary matters at a rather early age. When reading English or French texts, Meta Folke was able to translate them simultaneously into German, as some um, uh, observers and commentators uh, wrote. She was very well um, in fast translation and was able to translate simultaneously even. Uh, in 1788, she divorced from her husband, the musical director at Göttingen University, and went to Mainz to join this translation manufactory. Uh, later, <coughs> independently from this team of Forsters, she turned to translating novels of Anne Radcliffe, just to give you a few names what she did. Anne Radcliffe, uh, Charlotte Smith, Charlotte Lennox, and Elizabeth Hinchborg. The well, most well known is, of course, Anne Radcliffe with her Gothic novels which are still great. The others are more or less forgotten women writers of novels. In spite of her good education, her personal situation, coming back to Metaphorke, did not allow her to take her time in search for a personal style of translating. Unless Louise Gotche, the Dorothea Tick, she had to make sure not to miss deadlines rather than think about creative solutions to translation problems. So this, she was one of the first uh, whom I mentioned first who were really uh, translating fast and rather superfluously. Um, what is also striking in her case is that um, sometimes uh, she signed a translation on the title page which may not have been her own and this is, is probably the case in the translation of Thomas Paine's The Rights of Man of course a politically very um, subversive and again censorship etc etc book so um, it's, it's not really clear but it's, it's not um, impossible that uh, this translation was made by Forster in fact, but um, um, that metaphorically appeared only on the title page um, for reasons of, I don't know, of, of being safe, uh, maybe she was less suspicious, or um, so there are also strange uh, changes and movements with names sometimes. Forster himself did not uh, hide his motives for translating. It's uh, a quotation which I also think rather funny. He said, he wrote to his publisher, I'm translating first because I deliver a manuscript to you, second because you pay me, and third because I'm in need of money and translating is an easy way to earn it. Um, maybe for him it was easy, but in general we will not agree that translating is an easy business. A few words about fees for this translation jobs. Um, the average was three thaler per sheet. This was the common currency at this time, thaler. So three thaler, which is not uh, important as such, but if you compare it with the um, average fee for original writing, this is maybe interesting. For original writing, the average was five thaler, so you see go one step down when translating. But still, it was not bad uh, because uh, with something like 100 or 150 dollars you could uh, make a living for one year. And I tried to find out how much you had to translate to live for one year. So uh, something like 40 sheets would be enough to <laughs> not to starve. So, if you translated two novels, it was quite a good income. That's what I wanted to say. You would not be rich, but you could survive. And this was, of course, attractive for a lot of uh, educated people, 
some of them or many of them had studied theology and then had no work and they uh, became writers, journalists or translators or everything at the same time. So the next example is Fanny Tarno, uh, who was called Translation Machine because she <laughs> was very fast and did a lot of work. Um, and what is interesting about her is that, apart from the fact she, that she was that she was alone and divorced, we will be bored now by this statement. No. Um, What's interesting about her is that she she concentrated on women's literature. So I made a list of her translation. Um, it's a rather longish list. You need not really read it. Maybe the names are, are enough in the first step. Jenny Bastide, all of them French uh, writers. Generalin Bauer. Mm. The real name was Bo, uh, La Marquise de Crequy, uh, Madame de Cuvier, Comtesse d'Ache, Sophie Gay, Emily Gay Chirada. Um, by the way, her husband is also important in French um, press history. He had uh, some important uh, newspapers. He was the editor of important newspapers. Then Sophie Barnier, Madame Charles Bebeau, and Georges Sand, which is the only well-known writer in this uh, crew. And L Lady Sidney Morgan, the only English author in this list. Um, so. She concentrated on women's literature, mainly novels, and um, if you study the titles, you, you find immediately out that it's sentimental literature. It's, of course, uh, more or less love stories. Um, and um, one critic, uh, scholar of Fanny Tamo, wrote that you might uh, explain this, um, this tendency, this preference for, for love stories because she was herself unhappy. So I don't really accept this uh, interpretation, but if you ask yourself why did she translate 40 love novels within a few years, mm, altogether 10 years? Hmm? <laughs> yes, I also tend to this uh, explanation, but you could of course uh, construct some biographical uh, compensation uh, for frustration. <laughs> so this is this translation machine. You also saw the dates of publication in Italy. Within rather short time she did quite a lot of work. And in her case there is no uh, teamwork or anything like uh, helping hands visible. She seems to have done all this really on her own. I analyzed in more detail the Prophetin from Kashmir because the title itself already made me alert, but I will not uh, go into detail here. Um, it's what I can sum up is that <coughs> she she even um, enforced the sentimental um, contents and sentimental elements of this novel. It's the story of the impossible love between uh, an Indian uh, priest and um, no, no, a priest, uh, the, yes, priest and, and a missionary and, and this woman, and it's 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 all very tragic and um, and she skipped uh, all everything that was too long for a for an average reader, so she cut descriptions which were too long. And she, she also skipped uh, cultural details, which were very hard to explain. Lady Sidney Morgan was quite well educated in this Indian culture. Mm, and so there were lots of, of 
details about religion and life in India. And um, Fanitano cut all this and made, made it a simple love story, more or less, which in could India. be, well, traveling to Germany or maybe even to Serbia. <coughs> Why not? In the French version. Um, so, I come to the next and last example. Emilia Ville, whom I call the Great Unknown. Um, I suspect that you are not uh, inclined to research to find this name. No, it's a joke. Um, I wanted to say, if anybody finds uh, some trace of some Emilia Ville, I am really very thankful, but I gave up. Um, so I only can give you another list of uh, her translations. Again, very many French uh, women, but also men, as a male authors in this case. <coughs> um, Sophie Gay, again, some names we already know. Le Gouvet, Caratri, Marie. Um, you find these names and these novels, for instance, in, in all the lending libraries, circulating libraries of this time. Uh, because you don't find them in any literary history, even in rather specialized French literary histories, they are hardly uh, mentioned anymore. But if you study contemporary catalogues, as I said, circulating libraries, there yeah, you find all these people and they fill the shelves of these lending libraries. And it seems they were very much read and very popular and uh, again, Charles Sant, the only really known author. And I come to my conclusion, which uh, I called striving for distinction in the literary field. Um, <clears throat> this term of literary field, of course, refers to Pierre Bourdieu's uh, theory of the literary field, which is a field of competition where uh, all participants or actors, as uh, would you call them, acteurs, uh, trying to find a place, a position of their own in this field, which also gives them distinction. So you have to be visible in this field, and you get visible by making a difference. So you are different from all the other authors, uh, you develop a style of your own, and um, I'm sure you know this theory of the field, of the literary field. So, um, I thought you might, or we might try to adapt this theory also to the translation business. And um, I found some, some, I think, interesting um, um, quarrels, I would even call them, because uh, these translations were also quite often reviewed and uh, I quoted this satirical this passage from a satirical novel by Nikolai but um, there were some really um, expert uh, reviews and they of course had a close look at what people were doing and for instance Fanny Tano who cut off uh, half of, of paragraphs and, and dropped uh, special terms and, and specific cultural references. Of course, such a, a mode of translation was uh, criticized. And um, there is a, a review uh, of uh, Scott translations. I mentioned Walter Scott. Uh, here it's The Bride of Lammermoor by William Adolf Lindau and um, Ivanhoe <coughs> by Carl Ludwig Methusalem Müller. And there was a long, long review of these two translations in Überlieferung zur Geschichte, Literatur und Kunst der Form Midwelt in 1827. And by some, by some um, remarks, you, you can easily guess that the reviewer, the critic, was a woman. So I 
thought who might have been this uh, critic and I found out two possibilities but it's not really important. What is interesting for me here is that the reviewer insists that the particularities of the source text including national characteristics must be maintained in the translation. She establishes a clear dichotomy between the pole of autonomous literature and the commercial pole in the literary field which corresponds to the distinction between source text oriented translation dear to the Romantics, for instance Schlegel and Schleiermacher, and target text oriented translation on the other side. So we have here a clear um, discussion between these two uh, modes, yeah, target and source text orientation. And um, the mainstream of cheap and fast translations went in the direction of target orientation. Yeah? They wanted to make it easier for their readership. Uh, they, they didn't want to, to, to make it difficult for them to understand these stories. And there is this, um, trans this critic who really clearly says this is not uh, allowed or should not be allowed in real genuine literature. So we have a sort of raw, but anyway, um, positions in this uh, field of translation which are quite distinct. And I think this is also interesting to see how this um, growth, the increase of translating, led to a differentiation. Yeah? So people wanted to distinguish themselves already in the 20s. Um, the position of women translators, which I wanted to focus on, varies in this field. Some of them worked in the sector of high literature, autonomous literature, defending traditional standards and or searching for modest aesthetic innovations. For example, for this would be Dorothea Tieck. Some worked for the emerging market of popular lit literature and tried to earn a living from this activity, like Mita Forke or Fanny Tarno. Some of them addressed the female public and even succeeded in combining their translations with the introduction of feminist ideas. Again, Forkel would fit into this, uh, into this type and Tarno. The general development of authorship from the 18th to the 19th century leads from scholarly to commercial writing. That's the general movement. If from the point of view of romantic literary theory, translation was inferior to original writing, and became the only form deemed worthy of consideration in serious literature, the translation of popular literature was marked by double marginalization. So it's, it's quite clear if you read Schlegel or Tycho or whomever uh, theorist of this epoch, you, um, it's of course original writing which is uh, much more uh, esteemed and uh, worthy of, of even veneration. So translation was marginalized and popular was doubly, double marginalized, I would say. Generally relegated to a low position in the literary field, some women translators seem to have professed to an alternative poetics of adaptation and creative intervention instead of a poetics of genius and origination. Such a statement like this can of course only be corroborated on the basis of systematic analysis of historical translation, a project that should in the future be advanced by cooperation of literary studies and book history. As far as I'm concerned, I recommend this, or I modestly propose this cooperation between translation history and book history. And when it comes to cooperation, I can, can come back to the start and why not cooperate between Biograd and Vienna in this field. So, I thank you very much for your attention, and I'm, of course, here for you. Thank you very much. As I can recognize on the expression of these faces, uh, many people are eager to speak out. So, I wanted to mention that we are here very uh, colorful bunch <laughs> consisting of literary critics, um, literary metacritics, film literary philosophers, and um,
comparatists and uh, maybe for this occasion above all uh, we also have some eminent women translators among us so I'm sure that every single person uh, here has been touched or moved by some aspect of your lecture and I'm giving word to the audience no. <laughs> be free <laughs> Yes, I, I, I would like to thank you for this lecture, which really uh, interesting, uh, interesting for me, first of all, because I am uh, not familiar with German language, so the German translators is something really completely new uh, to, uh, to me as a theme. But I noticed at the beginning, and that is the, there, there is one question I have about... Uh, this is Gottschalk. Yeah. And uh, you said that uh, she uh, said the thing about French translation, mm -hmm. and, and I didn't catch the year or the uh, when when did she uh, she write that? But I I mean, immediately had the association with the Feiermarkel's famous text about uh, the, uh, the translation where he establishes for the future of uh, European thought of, of, mm -hmm. uh, on, on, on translation, mm -hmm. uh, that distinction between uh, target-oriented and uh, source-oriented, we can say today. Mm -hmm. and that was, so, uh, was, was, was that in the light of Schreimacher's ideas, or was it before mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. he wrote that and... Uh, were there uh, her idea something that? Yeah, yeah, it was in the 1740s. I, I think it was in 44, uh, seven, 1744. So it was, so it was quite some time almost before, eight before, years, before eight time. Years yeah, something before, like yeah. 80 years. Mm -hmm. and, and that's why I underlined and things. Um, I, I underlined that it was a really um, inno innovative step at this time. Huh? No, yes, no, no, it was. She had a, a series of innovative yes, yes, yes. ideas. Mm -hmm. Th that's what I was interested in. If if it's uh, if there is some um, I don't know. Um, I, I'm not in, in feminist studies really, but uh, of course there are some studies who um, say that women tended to be subversive rather. Yeah. So I. I just uh, tried to find out if if they did something different from from the male uh, colleagues or not, and some of them are at least uh, very interesting in this respect. They they really try to to make it differently and to do it better. Or, yeah. Of course, it's 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 almost impossible to compare men and women translators. That's maybe. You know, it's, it's maybe not a good idea, so, but... Um, and it's... they... They, uh, they also represent this uh, general development from Gottsched uh, scholarly approach to this simple commercial stuff and context. Okay. Mm -hmm. Tiana, please. Uh, you establish a very firm dichotomy between the high quality translators of mm. high quality literary texts and the more commercially oriented uh, translators. But uh, have there been any attempts uh, to bridge that gap? Mm. Can any, say, commercial translators try to uh, establish themselves uh, as translators of better, higher regarded texts? Mm. Um. Um, it's a good question. <laughs> In general, I would say uh, that there were other separate spheres, and uh, it's also obvious that you have to to know a lot if you are translating what we call Sachliteratur, uh, general literature, or scientific, or at least, uh, yeah. Um, so. But there are some, some, some people and some, some 
um, translators in this field who did both at the same time. It's true, but it's a it's a small minority, and it I think uh, the more the the field grew, the more there were specialists for everything. Um, this general people were rather in the late 18th century, but not in the 19th, uh, and the differentiated and specialized. I have two questions. Mm -hmm. uh, one is about numbers. Uh, do we have numbers of the participation of uh, female translators in translatorship in general, so masculine and female translators? Are they exception to the rule or they are uh, represented in a substantial numbers? That's my first question. And the second one, we've seen that there is a diversity of themes, but uh, some of light uh, love novels are very well represented there. Uh, did uh, any masculine translators uh, of importance uh, engaged in such uh, a kind of literature, or it was really a specialty of female translators? Um. The first question, no, I, I have not counted or <laughs> translated and divided the uh, percentage, uh, no. Um, but um, as far as I can uh, estimate, it, it was at l about half, half, half and half, that's, that's my um, estimation. And the second question, um, I haven't found any masculine translator who specialized like Fanny Talmor. No, this was her own um, I don't know, interest or preference. Uh, mm. Walter Scott translation, for instance, was 80% masculine. Uh, it's also interesting that um, <laughs> that, that um, <coughs> Dano decided to translate almost exclusively uh, French female writers. So very strange. <laughs> and then I never found it anywhere else yeah, because uh, if you are doing commercial uh, translating, you don't uh, distinguish uh, what it is, you just do it. And no uh, such a specialization I never found anywhere else. Yeah. Thank you. Tano? <laughs> Please. Question about Louise Watson. Oh, Glasnyi, some. Glasnyi, some. Question about Louise Watson. You said she translated the spectator. Yes. So, in which way did she translate the whole number or for some article and some No, no, no. They really translated the whole thing. Um, everything. It was, it was very in high demand, also in. Like a book, the number of the book. Yeah, yeah, so they, pr they produced a German version of, of all this. It, the, it was a very, um, I mean, popular is, is maybe said too much at the early 18th century, but there was a high demand for this kind of, of magazines, and there were lots of German. Um, adaptations and imitations of the spectator and, and um, they had also funny names like uh, Die Tugendsame Frau and something like that. It was also very much um, directed um, um, to, a, to, a fem to a female readership already. There are moralische Wochenschriften is the German term for this, moral um, weekly. Thank you. Someone interested? Please, mm. Igor. <laughs> I have a short methodological question. In which field of uh, uh, in which field of uh, literary uh, science of literary would you place your investigation or your lecture? Is it feminist uh, literary history, social literary history, or something in interdisciplinary field between uh, history of literature, social history of uh, 
some period of national history or uh, what? <laughs> <laughs> what do you suggest? <laughs> um, I'm open. <laughs> uh, no, uh, <clears throat> I, I think it's it's of course a sort of uh, cross crossing and uh, uh, cross over. <laughs> um, um, sometimes I'm asked what it what it can contribute to the study of a of a text, and of course I could not uh, really do it today or demonstrate it. Or, uh, but uh, <coughs> I think there there are really you could organize a, a say larger study, a comprehensive study, starting with this kind of context and and business questions and legal questions and all this. And then you could uh, insert and really analyze uh, a series of, of some examples. Yeah? Um, I, I'm, honestly, I never did it uh, on a larger level, only in, uh, in essays and articles. Uh, but I could imagine to, to really try to, to connect all this and to, to show the, the influence and the real um, I say um, that it's not a, um, a study which which is uh, has a purpose of its own. So, of course, if you're interested in literary history, you should also be interested in publishing history and all this. I think, but um, I, I think it, it really goes further, and you could uh, find the traces of all these uh, circumstances and context really also in a transla translation text. It's, it's it's maybe um, maybe I take this as a as an impulse an impetus to try to do this and then it would be maybe more obviously literary uh, study and literary history hmm? if you if you don't stop uh, when it comes to opening the book and checking the text and analyzing it. So far it is, uh, I think today it was social history of literature, yeah. We come to conclusion. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so any other questions, any other suggestions? Yes, please. Maybe a, a little naive question that translators, manufacturers, how did they really work? Technically, were everybody sitting in the video, working at home, how they had a sort of common place mm -hmm. and office working together, having vocabularies in common or something. Um, yeah, that's a good question. Um, no, uh, as I said, this manufacturing of factory is of course a metaphor, but in the case of Forster, for, in, for instance, of course they met and, and discussed these uh, things. As far as we know, they met in Forster's house. Yeah, They did not live together, but uh, of course they met and they discussed uh, their translations. Yeah. And you mentioned that some of them, especially, that they was a real profession. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Them, yeah. No, uh, basically they worked on their own at home. Uh, but uh, this team, they must have uh, had a intense communication, that's, that's obvious. And as far as I know and as far as I have read, it was Foster's house where they, where they really met. Mm -hmm. Yes, connected with, with this, this question, uh, our colleague Miras Pasic uh, also is uh, of uh, Miss Peek, who I did or or didn't want to know because her father yeah. didn't want to, to be known yeah. and I suppose that the collaboration with her father was something like well you had you said she was a handmaid yeah, uh, yeah. of translation. No, the, the so they really had um, Redaktionstreffen, um, they really met mm -hmm, and, mm -hmm, and uh, this um, meetings meetings of mm -hmm. Yeah, copy editing or whatever. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, um, this this Shakespeare translation was a, a, an endless story. You might know that there are so many uh, variants uh, in this history of, of editing this Schlegel translation. 
it started at 1810 and, and then Torque was, was rather active. <coughs> then um, Schlegel drop, dropped it, uh, this project, he was not interested anymore and, and moved it, or handed it over to Teak. And uh, there were, until um, something like 1840, I think it was 39, the fifth edition already appeared of this Schlegel Teak translation. And every single edition was different because they always changed and, and improved and, and etc. So, it, <laughs> and now it, I, I think it's at Bochum, they are establishing a critical edition of this actually Tick edition uh, translation. Mm -hmm. And it will be a very complex, a very complex <laughs> pattern, yes. So, um, uh, they really had um, meetings and they discussed and um, Schlegel and later Tick were only the, the uh, what do you call them, the responsible editors who gave their name and maybe sometimes or most of the time made the last uh, corrections, but um, the material came from Dorothea, from Baudissin, yeah, okay. some teamwork. Mm -hmm.